Skylab, the country's first space station, was put into orbit around the Earth today. But shortly after takeoff, two of the solar panels that provide power for the orbiting laboratory failed to unfold, and space agency officials are trying to decide whether to scrub the launch of a three-man crew scheduled for tomorrow. We have a report from science editor Jules Bergman. Right on time, after six years of planning and preparation, the unmanned Skylab space station lifted off from pad 39, and it all looked completely normal as the mission began. The huge Saturn V rocket, most powerful in the world, after boosting six teams of U.S. astronauts toward the moon, was on its final scheduled flight. Its mission, sending up the world's biggest spacecraft, the 100-ton Skylab, opening a new era in man's exploration of space. Thunderstorms, which might have threatened the launch, failed to materialize, and the Saturn V did its job perfectly, putting Skylab into a 270-mile-high orbit over the Earth. Once Skylab had been put into orbit, everything still looked good. The aluminum covering or shroud to protect the space station during liftoff was jettisoned as planned. The 12-ton Apollo telescope mount unfolded on radio command and locked into place. The solar panels for the telescope mount, which gather in the sun's energy and convert it to electrical power for the telescopes, also deployed perfectly. But then the troubles began. The solar panels for the workshop itself, right here and here, which supply the crew quarters with electrical power, failed to deploy properly. Shortly after launch, something went wrong and something shook loose, and the solar panels later couldn't be fully deployed. A meteoroid shield needed to protect the crew also got hung up, so the workshop isn't getting all the power or the protection it needs. Even as space agency officials struggle with the decision about whether to launch astronauts Pete Conrad, Dr. Joe Kerwin, and Paul White, the countdown is proceeding for the smaller Saturn 1B rocket that'll carry them into orbit tomorrow. By using the electrical power from the solar panels from the telescope, the mission can be flown but some experiments would have to be scrubbed or cut short. And it may even take the astronauts themselves circling the workshop after flying up to it to decide how badly the Skylab mission has been affected. The decision on launching the astronauts will be made sometime during the night. This is Jules Bergman at ABC Space Headquarters at Cape Kennedy. The first mission to Skylab was supposed to launch the day after the station, on the 15th of May, 1973. However, the damage to the station sustained on launch pushed the mission out 10 days so the crew could train for repairs they believed necessary. Without being able to see the station though, they weren't sure how extensive the damage actually was, and so they prepared for the worst. But, but the only thing I can say is we've come home to regroup. Uh, I'm hopeful that not only in the next five days that we can't figure out some way to take care of the problem, no meteorite shield, that. We'll be able to get 28 days out of it one way or another, and uh, they ain't luck at all, we may get all three of them done. But uh, we're going to have to sit down and scratch our heads and change the character of our flight a little bit here, because it looks like we're going to have to do some kind of repair work to the vehicle. The training is going super good. Can't tell you which method we're going to go with, because they haven't made up their minds yet, but we're ready to use any of them. On May 25, 1973, Skylab 2 lifted off from Launch Pad 39B, the first Saturn 1B launch in almost five years, and only the second ever launch from Pad 39B. Booster performance was nominal except for one momentary glitch that could have threatened the mission. When the commit signal was sent to the Saturn at ignition, the instrument unit sent a command switch to the launch vehicle from internal to external power. This would have shut down the Saturn's electrical system, but not the propulsion system, and likely caused the disastrous scenario of an uncontrolled booster requiring the launch escape system to be activated and the command module to pull away safely, followed by range safety destroying the air and launch vehicle. However, the duration of the cutoff signal was less than one second, too short a time for the electrical relay in the booster to be activated. Thus, nothing happened and the launch proceeded as planned. The glitch was traced to a modification of the pad electrical equipment, and corrective steps were subsequently taken to prevent it from happening again. 
Stand by for mode one, Bravo. Mark, mode one, Bravo. Roger, propellant top is RCS command. Roger. Mark, uh, one minute, eight seconds, roll program complete. LF Houston, your feet wet. Roger, your feet wet. That, that call up from Capcom, Dick Truly says, Skylab now capable of water landing. One minute, 20 seconds. Passing through the period of maximum aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle. One minute, 25 seconds, eight nautical miles in altitude. Mark, one minute, 35 seconds, pass through Max-Q. Skylab still flying steady on all eight engines. Coming up now on the staging and shutdown. Seven outboards out. And I got an F-4B light, Houston, and a nice staging. Roger that. Mark, two minutes, uh, 35 seconds, staging on schedule. Conrad White's curling now right here on a good second stage engine. Coming up now on launch escape tower, Genesis 4 bay. Tower, can you stop time? Roger, Tower, Jefferson, you're about to. Mark, three minutes, two seconds, 47 nautical miles in altitude. The launch escape tower now ejected, reports Conrad. His crew safety roll no longer required. 3 minutes, 12 seconds, 50 nautical miles in altitude, 84 nautical miles down range, velocity now reading 8,200 feet per second. Rendezvous of the Command Service Module in Skylab was accomplished in the fifth orbit. Upon reaching the station, Conrad flew their Apollo Command Service Module around to inspect the damage, and provided visual confirmation that one of its two solar array wings was missing, and the second one was only partially deployed. With the temperature inside Skylab approaching 125 degrees Fahrenheit, and no guarantee of clean, breathable air on board, the whole manned Skylab program was in jeopardy. However, Skylab 2 crew began what had never been attempted before, the on-orbit repair of a damaged, malfunctioning station. The crew soft docked to the station to avoid the necessity of station keeping. Then they undocked so that Conrad could position the Apollo to the jam solar panel. With his body extending out of the command module hatch, and his legs grasped by astronaut Kerwin, White's attempted to pry the surviving array free with a 15-foot pole, first with a shepherd's hook at the end, which was later replaced by a universal prying tool. However, attempts to free the solar array were unsuccessful. The crew then attempted to perform a hard dock to Skylab, but the capture latch failed to operate. So after eight attempts, they donned their pressure suits again and partially disassembled the command service module's docking probe, and the next attempt worked. On mission day two, after testing its atmosphere quality, the crew entered Skylab. The first thing they did was to deploy a parasol thermal shield through an airlock, and the temperature inside the Skylab dropped to comfortable levels. The crew still, however, had to adjust to a shortage of power. On mission day 14, June 7, 1973, astronauts Conrad and Kerwin opened the airlock module hatch and ventured outside the spacecraft. This time, the astronauts succeeded in removing the debris and fully extending the jam main solar wing, restoring much of the electrical power to the station. 
During the CVA, the sudden deployment of the solar panel structure caused both the astronauts to be flung from the Skylab hull, testing their nerves as well as the strength of their safety tethers. And after recovering their composure, both astronauts returned to their position on Skylab and completed the EVA. The spacewalk lasted 3 hours and 25 minutes. For nearly a month, they made further repairs to the workshop, conducted medical experiments, gathered solar and earth science data, and performed a total of 392 hours of experiments. The mission tracked two minutes of a large solar flare with the Apollo telescope mount, and they took in return some 29,000 frames of films of the sun. The Skylab 2 astronauts spent 28 days in space, which doubled the previous U.S. record. The mission ended successfully on June 22, 1973, when Skylab 2 splashed down in the Pacific Ocean 9.6 miles from the recovery ship USS Taika Daroga. Skylab 2 set records for the longest duration manned spaceflight up to that point, the greatest distance traveled, and the greatest mass docked in space. Pete Conrad had now set a record for most type in space for an astronaut. And that pretty well sums up Skylab.